Okay, so welcome. I uh, hope everyone's had a great conference. Um, we've obviously saved the best till last, uh, which is Tim's talk upstairs, so uh, feel free. Uh, my name's Sam Ritchie. Um, I'm from Perth. I, uh, I organise the Perth iOS developers, um, along with Adam, who's not here, um, and he's not getting his bribe. Um, and I'm also a, I also run a software consulting company called CodeSplice. Um, you should totally hire me to work on your stuff. All right, so today I'm here to talk to you about the go-to statement. The go-to statement was brilliant, okay, when it came out. It was, it was so awesome. You could type, you could do a, a label, a text label somewhere in your code in plain English, um, and you can go to that label from, uh, from anywhere else in your application, okay? So, you know, as opposed to trying to remember memory addresses and things like that, it was, it was brilliant. It was so much easier to maintain and understand and read and all, all those sorts of things. And it worked really, really well for a while. But then our applications got bigger and more complicated and, um, and it, it started getting really hard to, to track the control of flow of a program when you had go-tos everywhere. So they came up with this concept of structured programming. I don't know if anyone here is old enough to remember structured programming, but generally the idea was um, you could do all of your controller flow within the application just by using loops, uh, subroutines, and switching statements, uh, branching statements, so if and switch. Um, and you know, that, was, that was much better. You know, we, could res we restricted the way that we could move controller flow around the application. Um, but in return, we got back uh, code that we could understand more easily and we could maintain and it was more modular and all those, all those good things that we shoot for. And that worked really, really well um, for a while. But then um, I think one of the things that, that happened here was we moved off uh, you know, batch processes and, and command line applications and started building things like GUI applications and, um, and online servers and things like that. I think, uh, what was the, the quote in um, James's presentation? I, I, um, a big bucket of sad, mutable state, mutable, mutable bucket of sadness, or whatever it was. Um, so yes, we, we suddenly had all this mutable application state that we needed to manage, and um, in the old uh, structured programming model, we were sort of accessing that from everywhere, and it was really, really hard to, to sort of track what was going on and who was, who was responsible for changing what. And, um, and so you know, it sort of started to break down then, and then we came up with the, this bad boy. Um, we split up our state, into objects, okay, and we restricted what we could do in terms of you know what what our logic, what bits of logic could access the state um, um, in the encapsulation, and that that made things better. So we could more easily manage our, our mutable state. We could work out what was going on. It was more maintainable. It was more readable. Um, you're getting the theme. Um, that worked really well for a while, and I think this is where we are today. So we. It's not, I don't think it's as controversial for me to say today as it might have been five or ten years ago that we're pushing the boundaries of what we could really do with, uh, with good design with object orientation. So a lot of the things that we're trying to do now, like, um, like managing high levels of concurrency in our app because we're all wanting to build multi-threaded code, um, doing lots of event-driven code, um, and sort of manage, trying to manage object life cycles and, uh, and object dependencies, it starts getting really, really difficult. You know, it's sort of, it, in large code bases, it's really hard to work out what's going on. And we're really looking for that next step, that next thing that's going to restrict what we can do um, and make our code better and more readable, more maintainable, etc. And I believe that that's functional programming. Um, now, functional programming, I think, has got uh, some, some negative connotations associated with it. So uh, some people believe that it's too hard, it's an insanely difficult, and you need an IQ over 180 and questionable personal hygiene skills in order to do it. Um, some, some people think that... Uh, it's only really useful for in the academic field or if you're doing something mathematical. Um, some people think you need to use a special language to do it um, and you know, special uh, functional language. But it's not, it's, uh, function programming is really easy, okay? And it's really easy to get started and that's why I'm here today to talk to you about it is to try and convince you that you can get started today. You're probably doing some of it already, um, particularly with, uh, with optionals like Joe talked about. Um, and yeah, so I think I think it's the next step, and I'm trying to trying to break down some of the some of the uh, the preconceptions about it. All right, so um, random hipster. Uh, functional programming means different things to different people, but what it means to me is um, basically avoiding mutable state and side effects using pure functions. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about pure functions um, in a minute to, to try and explain what they are. 
and using functions as, as first-class citizens, okay? And, and Joe went through that a bit, um, but that's really using uh, higher-order functions, okay, passing functions through as parameters, and one of the main benefits there is we can write less code, we can reduce our boilerplate, and I'm a big, big fan of writing less code um, because uh, I think less code's always better. Now, um, I'm obviously um, trying to be gender-inclusive in, in my uh, hipster ridicule, <laughs> so if you're a, if you're a fan of standing out in a field with uh, weird glasses on, you know, whatever. All right, so <laughs> I, I don't know what. Yeah, I, I've got no words. Okay, so I've uh, I'm gonna I've, I have sacrificed several simulated goats, the demo gods. Um, so <laughs> hopefully this works okay, but. Bear in mind, I'm, uh, I'm running a pre-release operating system and a pre-release uh, IDE, so <laughs> anything can happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't tell them. <laughs> so this, this um, slide needed a, an image. Um, try Googling for pure functions and come up with a decent image. That was, you know, that's, that's a hipster water jar and, and it's got pure water in it, is, was the rationale. Okay, so a pure function is um, something that has no side effects. Okay, side effects are, you know, sort of observable changes that have been made as a result of running that function. Um, usually it's things like changing things on disk, uh, maybe modifying some shared memory, um, updating the UI, uh, doing network calls, you know, all the useful things that we <coughs> usually need to do in an app. And a pure function always returns the same output for the same parameters. Okay, so this is uh, what I called... Um, deterministic when I was doing SQL uh, function development. I don't know what people call it. The Haskell developers like using the term referential transparency, but I hate that word because it means more to a compiler developer than it does to, uh, to an actual programmer. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. Um, pure functions are important. Okay, they've got a couple of properties that are really, really uh, useful to us. Um, one is they can, they can be evaluated in any order. Okay, it doesn't matter what order they run in. We don't have to sort of... Uh, understand and restrict things running in a certain order to get the right output. And um, we could run them concurrently, side by side on separate threads, and we'll still get the same output. We know that because it, it's a pure function. Um, they're easy to test, okay? We don't need to set up a bunch of, you know, singletons or mock-out uh, methods or do anything like that. We just pass in the right parameters and out, out comes the result. And, you know, it's wrong or it's right. And I think the most important one, and it's probably the hardest one to explain, is they're easier to understand. And that sounds a little bit glib, but when you're um, dealing with heavily object-oriented code and you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, well, what happens when um, that's in this state and the device is doing this and I've, the user's previously done this, but uh, they didn't do it in this session, and what happens if I call this? That's really, really hard to understand, and that's where all your bugs come from. Okay? And when you're dealing with fewer functions, it makes it an awful lot easier. Um, now, obviously, pure functions, we can't do all of our code as pure functions because otherwise it would be perfect. It wouldn't do anything. Um, so we do actually have to have some impure code, um, but I think the goal is to understand what it is and make sure it's managed and, and sort of separated out. All right, so we've got, I've got an audience participation uh, uh, exercise. This is a pure or impure game, not global thermonuclear war because I forgot my launch codes. Um, now... I'm going to pop up a function. You guys are all going to yell out pure or impure, and I'll tell you if you're right. Okay? Easy game. All right, so first function, five minutes from now, current date plus five minutes. Is that pure or impure based on the, the rules that I've just explained? Impure. impure. Okay, let's check. Yes, it is impure. <laughs> this, is, this is a cover of a German death metal band called Impure. Um, I liked them before they were cool. <laughs> It's a fairly accurate depiction of the hell that awaits you if you write too much impure code. Um, obviously, if we're accessing current time, location, um, all of that sort of thing, we're getting back a different result every time, so it's impure. It's an impure function. Okay, so next, uh, five minutes from date, and we're passing in the date. Pure. Disco. <laughs> um, yes, and this is a common refactoring. You can pass in the non-deterministic aspect to, to turn it into a pure function. Uh, that's good. Uh, this one is a pretty easy one. You'll look at this. Impure. It's, uh, it's pretty much as impure as you can get. We're, uh, we're mutating a, you know, a global variable and returning a different value each time. So, yes, don't do that. Um, now, this one's a little bit trickier. Does anyone want to take a stab? Impure. Okay. 
I, um, I chickened out and sat on the fence for this one called a borderline. <laughs> a, a hardcore functional programmer would say that's, uh, that's writing to standard out, it's performing a side effect, it is impure. Um, in iOS development, it's not really changing any, any sort of observable uh, you know, behaviour of the application, so I tend not to worry too much about it. It does make it an awful lot easier to understand what's going on if you can put logging in your functions. Um, because you know, if you're in a, in a pure language like Haskell where you can't easily perform side effects, suddenly things like logging become really difficult. Um, so be thankful you're not one of those guys. Oh, some of you probably are one of those guys, aren't you? <laughs> okay, this is a tricky one. Okay, we've got a divide. Obviously, if you pass through zero as the second parameter, we're going to get a runtime error. No one's, no one's game. This is a pure function, but it's a special type of pure function called a partial function. And what partial function means is um, it doesn't return a value for all possible parameters, or rather, there are some parameters for which it doesn't return a value. Okay, it doesn't return a value as a euphemism for your app crashes. <laughs> Okay, so while it's technically a pure function, we probably still want to avoid it unless you know, you're know you super um, sure that it's, it's going to be okay. Um, just as an aside, while we're on the subject of euphemisms, uh, functional programmers have a term for um, runtime error. They call it bottom. Okay, I think it might be because they're Rick Mail fans or something. I don't know. No one got that. <laughs> you're all too young. Um, Okay, I've changed that divide function and now I'm throwing a swift error. Uh, pure or impure? No? Okay, this one is also pure, okay, and it is also a total function. Okay, we're always going to get a result regardless of parameters. Okay, it's always going to be the same result for the same parameters. There are no side effects. Okay, a swift error, throwing a swift error is basically just a different return type, okay, which is different to... Um, you know, stack unwinding exception type things that you use to in other languages. So use Swift errors, they are, um, you know, fully functional buzzword compliant. All right, so let's, ooh, what happened then? Oh, shh, don't tell them. Okay, I'll Google hipster pipeline and come up with this one. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a technique now that is really, really useful. Um, it's a functional technique. It's really useful because you can drop it into pretty much any code base and it'll start giving you value straight away. Okay, you can use it. It be the worst, most stateful object-oriented um, code base, um, but you can just start using this technique now and you should all be using this technique now if you're not already. Um, and Martin Fowler calls it collection pipelines. Okay, by all means, look it up on his blog if, you're, uh, if, if you want to know more about it. So the essence of it is we use a, a certain suite of higher order functions to operate on collections. We've seen some of those already in, uh, in Joe and James's uh, talks today. Um, so they're small reusable operations that are chained together. There are similar scenarios in most modern programming languages, but not Objective-C. So if you've mostly done Objective-C, you probably haven't used this approach before. Um, and we've got built-in support in Swift. Okay, and the three functions I'm going to talk about today are filter, map, and reduce. So... Let's uh, do some, some stats. So I've loaded some um, Star Wars data into my playground, and I'm going to do some queries on it um, just to show you how to go about using these, uh, these collection pipelines. So the first one is filter. Filter is the easiest one to understand, honestly. It's uh, as you'd expect it to work. It actually does exist in Objective-C. It's called filtered array with predicate. Um, and we apply a test to each element in array, and we get back a new array with the objects that pass the test. So if we want to know the answer to which characters have appeared in all star, in six Star Wars films, um, we can do a people.filter. Okay, and I'm going to use trail enclosure syntax and dollar sign syntax because they're awesome. Um, if you don't like it too bad. And I'll pop up the debug and we get out C3PO and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, I, should, uh, I should have said at the start, um, if you haven't seen all the Star Wars movies, there might be some spoilers here. <laughs> okay, so in this list we don't have Anakin Skywalker because after Anakin was seduced by the dark side, the good man who was Anakin Skywalker was destroyed. Um, so you can see what it's telling us is true from a certain point of view. <laughs> I'm, such a, I'm such a nerd. Uh, was he in the first one? Uh, I, I don't know, I didn't make the data. 
go, go and take it up with those Star Wars API guys. Okay, so the second one is map. Uh, some of you have seen map in presentations already. Um, that's what it looks like in pictures. Um, it is taking an array of something and transforming it into an array of something else by applying a transform function to each element. If it exists in Objective-C, it would probably be called array by transforming objects using block. Okay, so as an example of, the, of what we might want to do is we want to work out what species appear in the first film. So as an initial implementation, we might think we can do just print the species. But we'll run that and we'll discover that that didn't actually give us what we wanted because it's just got identifiers in that species array. Um, so luckily, I've got a, I've got a uh, constructor function. I've, I've got to map that into an array of species. Luckily, I've got a constructor function that uh, takes a, an identifier. And if we run that now, we'll get out the species that are in there. Um, that doesn't look exhaustive either because I don't see Hammerhead or the, or the band people or whoever else was in it. Um, so that worked really well. Um, just before I go on, uh, one of the things that you'll probably do when you first start using these sort of uh, functions is use closures for everything, uh, for all your, all your function parameters. Um, you'll end up probably using it in, in places where you don't need it. So if you're, all you're doing in your closure is passing through parameters to another function, um, you can probably get away with just passing the function through directly. And as of Swift 2, we can now do Dot we can now do that. And that looks awesome, and it gives you extra functional programming, heaps of the points. <laughs> um, all your co-workers will look at it and go, wow, you're so awesome and attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to me all the time. <laughs> okay, we can do more complex transformations. Uh, who were the characters in four or more films, and what films were they in? So here we're going to chain together a filter and a, uh, and a root point. That's, um, that's, uh, that's a bit of a Freudian slip there. <laughs> uh, so we want to filter uh, films.count. I can't type now. And then we'll map. And I'll do this one longhand. And what I'm going to do is I want to return a tuple. Does anyone say tuple or tuple? All right, tuple then. So I want to return the name, plus I want to return what films they're in, because that's me. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> hide, hide from them. Sometimes it comes back after a while if it does that. Yes, there we go. Okay, so Luke Skywalker appears to be in The Force Awakens. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Um, and uh, obviously here we can see we can do much more complex transformations using a map. Um, so, and map is really, really useful and you'll find once you work out how to use it, you use it all the time. Okay, so the last one here is reduce. Reduce is uh, a relatively easy concept, but the implementation is a little bit more complex. So reduce, whereas map um, operates on each element in the array individually, um, sort of in isolation, reduce, uh, aggregates the, the whole lot into some sort of a, um, an aggregate value. So the obvious application is to use for numeric aggregates. So if we did let total length. So you can see reduce has got two parameters. Uh, the first one is an initial value, and the second one is the combined function. So for, an, a, for a sum, a numerical sum will start with the initial value of zero, typically. And then the combine, I'll just do this longhand so you can see what's going on. Meters. That's a useful number to everyone. Um, so you can see what's doing there is um, it's basically a running total, that sum. Okay, so it, uh, it progressively goes through the array, uh, applies this function to each element, and uses the, the sum as a running total. Sometimes it's called an accumulator. Um, so that, that's how that works. It's reasonably simple to understand with the sum. Just before I go on, uh, I like trying to 
do those aggregate functions on the same types if possible. So you can do, for instance, a map length dot reduce. And what this lets me do is instead of having a closure for the combined function, I can pass through the plus operator. And again, <coughs> super uber hipster functional programming cred for passing through an operator as a parameter to a function. <laughs> All right, so we can do much more complex aggregates. So I've got one here, and I'm not going to try and type it out. I've got a snippet for it. Um, I'm grouping all planets by their climate. Okay, and print planets by climate. So just to show what's going on here, I'm starting with an empty dictionary. Um, I'm going through... For each element, I'm checking to see if, if the climate already exists in the dictionary, adding it if, if, if not, and appending the planet to the array. So I'm coming out with, for instance, uh, um, and what's got multiple? So hot is Mustafa, Solo, Kami, and Rhodia. Um, I don't know any of those. Are they from extended universe or whatever? <laughs> Okay, so that, that's cool. That, that's very complex. I can do some cool stuff with that. But I don't really like this code because I'm not, it's ugly and I don't like lots of code, as I, said, as I mentioned before. Um, one of the cool things about it is there's nothing in there that's particularly relevant to planets or climates or Star Wars or anything. Um, so I could rewrite that as a reusable function, and I've done that already, luckily. I've called it group by. And this does exactly the same thing. Okay, so you can write your own um, functions to go into this collection pipeline if you if you notice that there's things that you're doing all the time, um, and it makes your code a smaller and neater and more readable, readable. And it's a good example of getting rid of boilerplate like that. All right, so what's our time? Oh. <laughs> we're, we're not going to get through the rest of this, are we? <laughs> We started a bit late. Okay, so what I wanted to do, I'll just go really, really quickly through this and we'll see how we get on. Um, I, um, I was just going to bring everything together and try and illustrate uh, how you can build a whole heap of functionality using pure functions and segregate the impure part because that's where people often get stuck is they say, well, I can't do anything useful with pure functions, so I can't really do anything with pure functions, um, where, whereas it's, it really just is a different priority in terms of how you go about constructing your code. So the example I did was a blackjack app. I, it's not very hipster, I know, but uh, uh, that was all I could come up with. Um, if anybody does see this presentation, go write a blackjack app. I own half of that. Okay. <laughs> Just getting the, the stake in there. Um, so value types, functional style code, you'll often try and use value types where you can. Um, they, they, they lend themselves to doing functional style code. I've got uh, playing cards and a game uh, state, which is my deck of playing cards whose turn it is in the players. I've got a player and a dealer in here. And I've got some custom debug string convertibles. So first up, I've got a, I need to generate a deck of cards. Um, I've, built a Cartesian product function. Does everyone know what a Cartesian product is? Okay, I'm just trying to generate every possible combination of the two arrays. Okay, so, so I've done a Cartesian product of my suits and my ranks, and then I'm mapping those into playing cards. Again, I can do playing card dot unit, like a, like a hero. Thanks. That's a uh, pet program for us. Okay, so I've generated a deck, and that was pretty cool. I did that in one awesome line of code. Um, I probably want to shuffle my deck, so shuffle. I've defined a shuffle function there, so I'll get a shuffled version. Note, of course, because that's random, I've got impure code. So let's just move this down. Um, we're going to do... Um, just going to try and race through so we get stuff done. Um, so we're going to need to create a new function. Oh, you. Uh, create a new game. Okay, and what I've done there, just to, to be obvious, I'm, I'm passing in the deck 
as a parameter because it's shuffled, it, it's, it's uh, non-deterministic. Um, I want to make sure that um, as much of my code is pure as possible. And obviously I'm doing a map on my player string there. So I can create a game. Deck. And I'm going to play... I'm going to play Tim so I can beat him at something. Uh, print my game. Okay, and you can see there I've got I've got Sam, Tim, and Dealer, and we've got the we've got the cards. So I'll just implement Deal. I'm such a good typer. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go into detail about these because I want to try and move it through. Um, I do need an add card function. Now just on this, you'll notice that in my add card, I'm not mutating my player type. And again, with my deal, I'm not mutating my game. I'm returning a new one. Okay, so this is a common pattern to make sure you can use immutable types um, where possible. Um, you know, so that they're, they're immutable and awesome and buzzword compliant. Um, so I can do... Okay, um, deal. And we want to we want two cards each. So, all right. So we've dealt out two cards. Um, we're going really well. Uh, I've got a hit and a stand function, which are very very similar. Um, hit obviously uh, adds a card to the current player, the player's current turn it is, and then stand moves it onto the next player. Once the last player stands, then the dealer does what his his stuff is, and uh, and the game ends. Um, so I'll briefly put that in. Okay. Game done. Uh, I'm going to hit and then stand, and Tim can just stand. He's got enough cards. Okay, and the game should be done. Uh, that's a trap with using immutable types. Sometimes you forget to reassign them. <laughs> okay, so I've got three cards. Tim's got two. The dealer's just done three for the moment um, because all I've done there is, is he's hitting for his strategy. Okay, and scoring, and again, just in the interest of trying to get to the end, um, I will do a player score. And a game outcome. That should all work, and my dealer strategy I've got as well. And it's dead. Yay! Yay. We nearly, we nearly made it there. Not sure if it's worth trying to finish. Uh, dealer. Hang on, where was I? Okay. Move down the bottom again so we can still see what's going on. Um, and so, print scores, and win. So I'm just going to print out, I'm using a loop there, um, even though um, we shouldn't really use loops. I, I, I forgot to mention that. Um, those collection pipelines, you should always use those instead of for loops, unless you need to perform side effects. So there shouldn't be any reason for you to use a for loop um, anymore, unless you need side effects. But I need side effects here because I'm running the console. Okay, so if we have a look at that, we've run our game and uh, I busted and the dealer won, so that's not a very good game for me. <laughs> All right, but the point here that I was trying to get to was this is the sum total of our impure code um, at the bottom there. That's where we do our shuffling. That's where, we do our, that's where we've got our mutable variables. Um, the rest of our code here is all pure and immutable. Okay, we can do lots of cool stuff there, like um, we can perform... Uh, lots of unit tests. It's really, really easy to unit test. We don't have to set up a lot of state. Um, we can you know, spin off lots of uh, simulations, thousands of simulations on a background thread after the user performs an action and know that we're not going to screw up the, the game because the state's immutable. Um, there's lots and lots of good things that we can do there. Um, all right, so let's... Oh, I don't want to do that. Let's wrap it up just so I can get my anvil in. And I guess... Um, all I was trying to get to was, please uh, consider trying to use a more of a functional style in your app. I think it's coming anyway, so it's worth having a head start, but um, it's not too difficult. It's not scary. You don't need to worry about the big words like the, the end defunctors and the, and the applicatives and things like that. 
Um, just try and work on segregating your impure code, use those collection pipelines, that's the main takeaway, use those collection pipelines, and uh, thank you very much.